Hi everyone, so we're going to pick up on page 50, uh, 51 where we left off. Um, sorry, this video is a little bit late. I got a new microphone so the sound quality would be a little bit better. So we finish off on page 51 with Lisa's visit to Tab's house. Tab's house is different not only in the poor condition that it's in but also uh, in terms of the freedom she has. So as we notice here, uh, she swears. And what is Lisa's reaction? She says, I sucked in a breath, shocked, thrilled. Mom would never let me get away with swearing the way Tabs did. So there's a difference in terms of how they're raised as well. And then Lisa goes on to talk about her Aunt Trudy a little bit. She says, but Gertrude, Tabs' mother, wasn't anything like mine. Dad said that even when they were kids, he never called his sister Gertrude because if you did, she would backslap you into next week. She hadn't officially changed her name to Trudy, but if you were smart, you didn't call her anything else. We could hear her vomiting in the upstairs bathroom, then clomping down the stairs to Tab's room, hungover and cranky. She sent me home saying I could damn well eat, eat out someone else's fridge. Uh, so... So it becomes pretty clear here that Trudy is a severe alcoholic and that's one of the reasons why the situation is so different at her house than at Lisa's house. Um, and we also move into a description of Mick's apartment, the setting there. Like Trudy's place, Mick's apartment is in poor condition. Uncle Mick's apartment was large but almost empty. He had a TV, a battered plaid sofa that spelled moldy, a kitchen table with some crates in place of a missing leg, a mattress on the floor, and a dresser with all the knobs broken off. The only new thing was an 8-track, which would have been great if he'd played anything but Elvis. Later, Dad told me Mick was very happy I'd been named after the king's daughter, but disappointed that they hadn't named Jimmy Elvis, or at the very least, Presley. This is a summer where Lisa gets to spend a lot of time with her uncle Mick. Uh, we find out he was he was on workman's comp because he was hit by a logging truck. Um, again, it's I'm not sure exactly how old Lisa's here, but probably around 10. Lisa's a little bit precocious here and asks just flat out asks her uncle how he got shot, uh, and he's reluctant to tell her the story, but she says over here. I like stories. Um, this is on page 53 in your book, about halfway down. So we find out here that um, Mick wouldn't take any money for babysitting the kids. And so in exchange, Al ends up buying him a new mattress. Um, one thing that this points out is that the brothers, even though they're very different from each other, um, they take care of each other. Lisa's next flashback is of a funeral. Um, her dad's cousin died and she's at a settlement feast. So this is about a year before um, the previous flashback. So she's about nine or 10. We learn a little bit about the characters here. We learn again, Kate has the nicest house. She has the biggest kitchen. So that's where everyone goes to cook. Uh, Jimmy's starting out his swimming career. He's at one of his first swim meets. Um, Lisa is a bit of a tomboy. She hates wearing her pink dress. And some more information about Mick here. Um, this is on page 56. For work, Uncle Mick wore his plaid shirt and rubber boots. On hot days, he wore his message t-shirts. Free Leonard Peltier or Columbus, 500 years of genocide and counting. Usually he wore a Levi jacket with trail of broken treaties embroidered in bright red thread on the back. For this feast, he changed into his buckskin jacket with fringe. His aim higher join the American Indian Movement t-shirt and his least ratty pair of jeans. He spotted us and let out a moose call. Mom cringed. Conversation stopped and people turned to watch my uncle as he came over to our table. When I sat in his lap, he let me play with the claw that dangled from his bone choker. 
He wore it all the time, along with an earring of a silver feather. A bit of background on the American Indian Movement and Leonard Peltier. Uh, this case was a significant event in the formation of the American Indian Movement. Um, so basically, Leonard Peltier was part of the American Indian Movement. He was an important activist. And he got into uh, a conflict with the tribal chairman of the Oglala Nation, and that's the guy who had the goons. Um, the FBI also really didn't like the, uh, the American Indian Movement. So the story is that the FBI supplied the goons with an intelligence on American Indian Movement members and looked away as goons committed crimes. Uh, one former goon member reported that the FBI supplied him with armor-piercing ammunition. So Leonard Pelche was jailed uh, because of the Wounded Knee occupation, his role in that. Uh, it was a shootout with the FBI and the goons on one side and the American Indian Movement on the other. So this would have been somewhat like Mick's experience on the Rosebud Reserve where he was shot by the goons, the, the, the wound that Lisa was asking him about earlier. So it's pretty clear, a couple of things about Mick uh, become clear here. One is that he's a very charismatic person. Everyone turns and looks when he walks into a room. The other is that he um, is very traditional. So beyond just the American Indian movement stuff, he has other traditional clothing, a buckskin jacket, a bone choker, um, an earring with a silver feather. Um, also, we learn in the next paragraph that Lisa's mom, even though she's maybe not traditional in quite the same way, she does have some traditional clothing. Um, and this is an allusion to a particular story. So here, page 56, it says, Mom had her everyday earrings, the one with two delicate gold coins, the tiny carved ravens or the gold nuggets, and her special jewelry that was kept in a small safe in the basement. I liked those best. A gold brooch of a raven clutching a fiery opal, a necklace of real pearls. So we know ravens are traditional for the Heisla people, but also the brooch, this is um, a reference to a specific story. It's a story called Raven Steals the Light, and it's an origin story about how light was created in the world. So a creation story. And the story is about an old man who has light, and uh, it's a bunch of boxes that get dec that decrease in size. And in the very smallest box in the very center is, is the light. And the raven tricks him to releasing the light. And the raven does this, um, not in order to help people, but just because he wants more light so that he can hunt and get more food. So this is a, it's an important story for a lot of Northwest Indigenous people, and this brooch is a specific reference to that story. So we see that um, even though the adults in this story are very different in terms of how they approach tradition, that they're all in some way, um, they embrace and relate to their Heisler roots. Another significant event in this flashback is when Mama, uh, Mama U sees Trudy. Um, this is on page 57. Mama U entered the gym wearing a black sweater. I called to her and ran back to our table and pulled out a chair for her. As soon as she saw Aunt Trudy, Mama U's wide smile hardened into falseness. She sat stiffly in her chair. Trudy, she said. Mother, Aunt Trudy said. If you get bored, I have a Pac-Man game. I offered it to Mama U. You can use it if you want. Lisa, Mom said in a warning tone. If someone's speaking, you have to listen, Mama U said. You have to show them respect, even if... Yes, be a good girl, Lisa, Aunt Trudy interrupted. Be a fucking little lady. See what that gets you. Mom asked me to get her a coffee, and when I came back, no one at her table wanted to talk. So Jimmy comes in with his dad. Jimmy's just won a swimming medal. Um, we know he's won a lot of medals for swimming because his dad says that they're going to have to build a trophy case soon. 
Um, Al is shocked to see Trudy sitting beside Mama U. So um, it's obvious they don't get along on a regular basis. Then they go talk to Josh. And remember, Josh is the guy who is the captain of the fishing boat, the one that Jimmy goes missing on in the present day. Mama U gives Trudy a warning about Josh. She says, you be careful, Trudy. Josh isn't right. Trudy gave an exaggerated sigh. You think he's not good enough for me, or is it the other way around? Mama U's lips thin to a tight line. Mick came back to the table as there was a bustle of activity at the head table. He pulled up a chair and wedged himself between Mama U and Aunt Trudy, loudly announcing that he wanted to be between the two most beautiful women in the whole of Kitabat Village. So the way I interpret this is that Trudy and Mama U still care about each other. Um, Mama U is trying to protect Trudy still, and Trudy still cares about what Mama U thinks about her. Um, so even though there's a lot of tension, there's still love there. The other thing to notice here is that Mick is, is the peacekeeper here. So he gets along with both Trudy and Mama U, and he has this way about him. A uh, sense of humor and charisma that um, allows him to sort of ease the tension in difficult moments and help people get along. So at the end of this flashback on page 59, we learn a little bit more about where some of this tension originates from. Um, Lisa just asks Tab, uh, why doesn't your mom talk to Mama Ooh? I asked Tab when we were reading comics in my bedroom. Tab sighed, don't you pay attention? I pay attention, I said, getting indignant. No, you don't. Baba U was an asshole. He beat Gran. Instead of sending him away, she sent Mick and Mom to residential school. And? God, you can be so dense, she said. So in the next few pages, we learn a bit more about the differences between Mick and Al. We learn on page 61 that the last time Lisa goes to be babysat by Mick, um, she hears from outside glass breaking and swearing. And so what happened? Uh, so Mick had just found out that his hero Elvis died. The family has to file a missing persons report because Mick takes off. And uh, they're mad at him, so Al doesn't talk to him. And in order to make it up to Al, Mick comes with an offering of freshly killed deer. Uh, but Al um, doesn't appreciate this, um, or he seems not to anyway, because he says, do you expect me to carry this in myself? Um, so it seems like there's still some conflict going on there. Then we move to uh, the next few pages, talk about... Lisa getting into a fight with these three boys, particularly this kid, Frank. So Frank is trying to run her over with his bike. So how does Lisa handle this? She ends up uh, punching Frank and then biting him in the leg. This is on page 65. And then Erica's brother, JJ, comes and breaks up the fight and takes Lisa home. And he tells Lisa's mom, if you think she looks bad, you should see the other kids. Then Lisa goes to the emergency room. Frank is there. And Lisa's mom and Frank's mom get into a fight. Um, Mick is there, and he sticks up for Lisa, too. We also learned that Josh is uh, Frank's uncle. And then apparently he comes to Lisa's door three days later and says he's taking care of Frank for her. Over on page 68, Lisa remembers Mick taking her Christmas tree hunting that winter and hearing songs like FBI Lies, Fuck the Oppressor, and I Shot Custer. Then she remembers an incident she had at school. Bottom of page 68. She's got to know about these things, Mick would say to Dad, who was disturbed by a note from one of my teachers. She'd forced us to read a book that said that the Indians on the northwest coast of British Columbia had killed and eat people as religious sacrifices. My teacher had made, each, made us each read a paragraph out loud. When my turn came, I sat there shaking, absolutely furious. Lisa, she said, 
Did you hear me? Please read the next paragraph. But it's all lies, I said. The teacher stared at me as if I were mutating into a hideous thing from outer space. The class, sensing tension, began to titter and whisper. She slowly turned red and said, I didn't know what I was talking about. Mama U told me it was just pretend, the eating people, like drinking Christ's blood at communion. In a clipped, tight voice, she told me to sit down. Since I was going to get into trouble anyway, I started singing Fuck the Oppressors. The class cheered, more because of the swearing than anything else, and I was promptly dragged, still singing, to the principal's office. Mick went out and had the teacher's note laminated and framed. He hammered a nail into his wall and hung the note in the center of the living room. He put his arm around me, swallowed hard a few times, and looked misty. My little warrior. So Lisa experiences racism here at school. So you've got a direct conflict here between oral tradition from Mama U, traditional Heisland knowledge, and the knowledge in the textbooks. So this ceremony, according to Mama U, was um, a ceremonial thing that humans, real humans, were not eaten, but uh, the anthropologists, when they came over, had written that, and that's what ended up in the textbook. So it's not indigenous knowledge that's in the textbook, and Lisa's sticking up for herself here. Um, her parents aren't super happy about it, but um, as we can see, Mick is very proud of her for standing up for her, uh, for her traditions. The next couple of pages deal with this Christmas tree hunt. Um, there are a few instances of Christmas tree hunting in this book, and different characters react to it differently. So uh, pay attention to that and think about why, uh, what the symbolic meaning of these Christmas tree hunts might be. Over on page 71, we meet a new character, Barry. So we learn on page 72 that Barry is Mick's former brother-in-law. He remembers that Mick married his sister in a traditional Indian wedding and that they didn't stay married for very long. So a little bit more background info on Mick there. In the next flashback over on page 74, Lisa remembers going palum picking with her uncle Mick. Palum is the shoots of the thimbleberry and salmonberry bushes. Pay attention to how food is described in this novel. Um, traditional foods especially are described with a lot of very vivid imagery and descriptive detail. Lisa says, winter in Kitimat meant a whole season of flaccid, expensive vegetables from town. Callum was the first taste of spring. The skin of the shoots had a texture similar to kiwi skin, prickly soft. Once you peeled them, the shoots were translucent green, had a light crunch and taste close to fresh snow peas. Callum picking lasts a few weeks at best. There's a contrast between traditional food and um, supermarket food here. Um, the supermarket food vegetables are expensive, as they are in a lot of First Nations communities. And traditional foods require more effort, but the effort is worth it because the quality is better. And Mick and Lisa drop off the Callum at Mama U's house. And there are some um, important details about the setting. Uh, the setting of Mama U's house shows uh, aspects of her character. So here's the description. Mama U's house was one of the oldest in the village, a box with a low ceiling basement and a steeple-like roof. It was painted a plain flat brown, which was peeling back to reveal gray wood. The glass in the windows was so warped that the world outside looked like it was being reflected through a funhouse mirror. She never liked gardening, so the lawn was wild with tree-high elderberry bushes and a tangle of uncrimmed, untrimmed grass. Mick opened the door and stepped inside and said, Yowts! So we learn here Mama is uh, quite the minimalist. She doesn't like to garden, unlike her son Al. She just sort of lets things grow. Um, she wears her clothes till they're threadbare. And any time she gets anything new, she puts it in her storeroom. So when Gladys tries to buy her a new apron, uh, she just sticks it away and keeps using her ratty old aprons until they, she can turn them into rags. Over on page 75, Mama U mentions that she never even locks her doors because she doesn't have anything worth stealing anyway. But Lisa's parents, uh, they do lock their door because they said somebody has already broken into their house to steal the stuff they have. And on page 76, Lisa mentions that Mama U doesn't even have, she doesn't have any video recording devices and she doesn't even have a color TV. She also mentions that she hears 
news about Highway 16. Um, just to note that Highway 16 is also referred to as the Highway of Tears because um, a large number of Indigenous women have gone missing on that highway. The highway is remote and there's not a lot of public transportation around, so uh, women are often traveling on the highway with um, nobody around, and that's one of the reasons why so many women have gone missing on this highway. So I'm not going to read page 77 to 80, um, but there's some beautiful, beautiful descriptive detail in there about salmon berries. Then there's the event in the spring where Mama U takes Lisa um, down to the octopus beds to have a ceremony for Baba U's birthday. So they bring uh, alcohol, cigarettes, and Twinkies, and then do an offering to the fire. So in the next flashback, uh, Lisa's hanging out with Tab. They're probably around 11 or 12 here. <clears throat> and um, they're going to have a cigarette at the graveyard, and Lisa sees Baba U's grave. So we learn a little bit about um, a little bit of background information on Baba U here. Baba U served in uh, the Second World War, and it says uh, when he came home, he couldn't get a job or get the money he thought he should get from Veterans Affairs because they said Indian Affairs was taking care of him. Indian Affairs said if he wanted the same benefits as a white vet, he should move off reserve and give up his status. So this, uh, we talked about this a little bit before in the beginning of the course. This is enfranchisement and um, Indigenous soldiers, when they came back, they were always given an ultimatum. So if they wanted the same benefits as other veterans, they had to give up their status and move off reserve. Baba U would have to leave Kitimat. Um, he'd have to leave his family, as Lisa points off, uh, points out. He'd lose his his house, the house they had, um, and the children were already established in the community. Baba U lost his arm, and he didn't have benefits, and he wasn't able to work, which affected Mama U and all of the four kids. So then there's this sort of gothic interlude here on page 82 where Lisa talks about a traditional Heisla burial ground with all of the um, headstones carved into eagles, blackfish, ravens, beavers. Lisa mentions that people in this graveyard were buried in mass graves during the time of the Great Dying, which would have been a pandemic caused by a European disease. So mass, mass amounts of people dying at the same time and being buried in mass graves. Notice the change in diction in this passage. Um, it sort of shifts to a more otherworldly poetic tone. She says, pick wild blueberries when you're hungry. Let the tart taste sink into your tongue, followed by that sharp sweetness that store-bought berries lack. Realize that the plumpest berries are over the graves. In the next few pages, um, 82 to about 86, we're back in the present again, and we're, uh, everyone is searching for Jimmy. On page 85, 86, uh, Lisa talks in a lot of detail about ulican, the fish, and ulican grease. Um, it's a staple of the diet in the northwest, northwest coast. Apparently, it's a very strong-tasting fish, and people who grow up with it love it and people who try it, who didn't grow up with it, find it um, overbearing. Ulican's a very oily and nutritious fish, which is why it can be one of the main foods and keep people healthy. Then Lisa goes up to Jimmy's room and um, sees a picture of karaoke, and she remembers Jimmy and karaoke's conversation about the photo. Lisa mentions that Jimmy has replaced all of his swimming stuff with pictures of karaoke. So it looks like in the present day, Jimmy's given up on his swimming dream and that he's dating karaoke. So Lisa goes on this trip with her uncle Mick, her mama U, um, Aunt Edith and Uncle Gordy, and her mom. And her dad and Jimmy are at a swim meet in Terrace. And Lisa gets some traditional Heisla knowledge from Mama U here. It says, um, Mama U used to say Winter loved Kitimat so much that he didn't want to leave. He gave up only when the Ulikins came, and then he packed reluctantly, grumbling and cranky. On Wamuk's Ah, uh, the day Winter shook out his cape, the snow fell in big flakes. 
but later the sun came out and men melted them all away. That was winter going home. The Heisla word for the first day of spring here um, personifies spring as somebody who's going out with a fight, so to speak. So winter shaking out his cape, um, throwing out some big snowflakes just as spring is coming in, but then shortly after melting them all away and then spring starts. The word itself actually um, shows winter as, as a human who is uh, going out grumbling and cranky. We get a bit more info about the relationships here. Um, everyone is teasing each other, which is just part of how the family interacts with each other. And we know that Mick has known Gladys for some time because as he, he talks about knowing her when she was a kid and said that they used to call her Miss Bossy Pants. Well, something happens to Lisa on this trip over on page 91. She has a vision. Behind us, the village, the road to town, the hazy plumes of smoke and the bright orange lights of Alcan shrank away. Ahead of us, the mountains stretched along the sides of the channel. As we rode near the Colada Valley, I felt a sudden chill. A white man and his son, in matching neon green and black scuba gear, stood on a point, waving to us. I stood up and waved back wildly. Who are you waving at? Mick shouted over the engine. He was looking at me like I was nuts. The reason why they're going to Kamano is that the Kitimat River um, has been polluted by all the industry in town. Um, Mom said the runs used to be so thick you could walk across the river and not touch water. You didn't even need a net. You could just scoop them up with your hat. She also mentions the difficulty of um, have, following a traditional way of life. She says, most people go out to the Kamano and the Kittelope these days, but you have to pay for gas and you need a decent boat and you have to be able to spend a few weeks out there if you want to make grease. If you have a job, it's hard to get enough time off work. And then Lisa talks about the traditional role of Ulikin for the Heisla people. So the the Heisla people used to make Ulikin grease to trade for other things. So it was part of a trade work in the a trade network in the northwest coast, and the Heisa would use the Ulikin grease to get other things that they needed to survive. Mick teaches Lisa about the water and how to drive a boat, and then they stop over um, near Wiwa, a small cove about a half an hour from the village. Lisa says a forestry camp is there now. They built their base over one of the best crab beds on the channel, but back then the crabs caught there were large and fat. There's also a hot spring here, so Lisa and Mick go into the hot spring. Over on page 96, Lisa talks about how she wants to be a warrior like her uncle Mick, but Mick discourages her. Then she learns uh, a story about when her parents were first dating. So Mick tells her that the first time her parents got together, that her dad was stuck because of the snow and that her mom got drunk outside his house and made a bunch of snow angels outside of his house. Um, and Lisa doesn't believe her because, of course, Gladys is a lot different as an adult. Then Lisa and Mick um, go and try to find some crab. So they go over and check their crab traps and they find this halibut. So there's this halibut that somehow got into the crab trap. And um, it doesn't make sense because as Lisa says how to get through such a tiny hole. And Mick tells her not to touch it, that it's either really good or really bad luck. So this is something that you see, I've seen it in multiple Indigenous oral traditions, where if something comes, comes by too easily, then um, you have to be wary of it. Over at the top of page 99, Mick describes it as a magical thing. So he doesn't know about the halibut, he doesn't know how it got there, so it's important to, to let it go. Mick says, we got enough crabs anyway, let's get going. So a couple of things. One, they have enough, so it's important not to take more than they need. And also, uh, they need to be wary of something that came too easily and that they don't understand because that's bad luck. So over on page 100, they finally get to the, the cabin where they're staying and Lisa jumps around. Uh, she's really excited to be there because of all the adventure. 
Gladys tells her to calm down, and then Uncle Mick takes her to collect water. Lisa asks what he's talking about because she doesn't realize there's no running water. So uh, she ends up going with, with Mick uh, with a bucket to go pick up some fresh water. Lisa talks about the ghosts, so she hears the ghosts laughing. Uh, at first, she thinks it's um, all of her family, but then realizes when they stop laughing and she still hears it, that it must be ghosts. So she thinks there are ghosts in the cabin and ghosts in the place that she, she's in. She's having a vision, so this shows her connection with the supernatural. She's seeing and hearing things that other people don't see and hear. Take a look at the description of the water that Lisa and Mick collect over on page 103. They're at a stream. The stream was quiet, making whispery sounds. Mick finally stood up and dipped his pails into the pool. I handed him mine, and he finally filled it halfway. The water was clear but littered with twigs. Taste it, Mick said. I shook my head. It's good. As if to prove it, he leaned over the pool and dipped his hand in the water. <sighs> he moved aside and I cautiously copied him. It was burning cold and sweet with the taste of trees. He grinned. I drank a few more handfuls. Mick lifted his pails. They sloshed over and splashed his legs. This reminds me of Bernard Nelson's description of the water when he came to speak for our class. So the, the idea of the water being uh, pristine, clear, and unpolluted. So we're going to skip over to page 107. So Lisa's afraid to go to the outhouse and people, um, she asks Uncle Mick to watch her while she goes. Then when she comes back, she explains why she was scared. So. She says, I just don't like the ghosts. Mick says, ghosts, huh? Don't you believe in ghosts? Did you see them? I shook my head. I just heard them laughing, Mick grunted. Aunt Edith had left for bed by the time we went back inside. Mom had cleared off the table and was scraping the leftovers into a bag. She says she heard ghosts, Mick said to Mom. Mick, I said, glaring at him. Ghosts? Mom said. Damn it, what have you been telling her now? Nothing, Mick said, indignant. Right, did you tell her about Baba Oo? No, did you? No, Lisa, has your dad been telling you stories? I sat in my chair and glared at my feet. No one ever believed me. Best way to keep ghosts away is to fart, Uncle Gordy said. Nah, don't tell her that, Mom said, suddenly smiling. It's true, Uncle Gordy insisted. Mick started telling me about the time Baba Oo went hunting mountain goats up the Kittelope, but Mom shushed him. She'll have nightmares, she said. If you tell her about Baba Oo seeing ghosts, I'll have to take her to the outhouse every time she wants to pee. Ghosts may ask, Uncle Gordy said. Old Bugger was probably drunk as a skunk. So we see on page 108, Mick has a nightmare and is yelling the word cookie. Gladys tells Lisa not to ask him anything the next day. The next day, Lisa hears Mick yelling. Um, she wakes up to him yelling, how? Mick was shouting. They were after the numbers. That's all they wanted. How many converts they could say they had? How many heathens they... Mick, Mom said, running in from the porch. What's wrong? Wrong? What's right? He's gone crazy, Uncle Gordy said. Crazy? I'm crazy? You look at your precious church. You look at what they did. You never went to residential school. You can't tell me what I fucking went through and what I didn't. I wasn't telling you anything, Aunt Edith said. I was saying grace. You don't get it. You really don't get it. You're buying into a religion that thought the best way to make us white was to fucking torture children. Enough, Mom said, standing in front of Mick. We're going to look for Oolikins now. Go get your things, Mick. So basically, we learn here that Mick's been through a lot of trauma, and a big part of that is his experience in residential school. On page 112, Lisa gets some traditional teachings about the water as they approach the Kitlope River. The rain let up just as we got to the mouth of the Kitlope River. My mom leaned over and dipped her hand in the water, then washed her face. 
After stubbing out his cigarette, Mick did the same. When you go up the kittelope, Mom said, you be polite and introduce yourself to the water. I didn't see the point and said so. It's so you can see with fresh eyes, Mick said. Over there, Mom said, pointing to the left bank. Somewhere up in that part of the forest, there's a village that was buried under a landslide about 500 years ago. Yeah? I said, perking up. Can we go see it? No one knows where it is. The forest looked like all the other forests around. Far out. So Lisa's learning traditional knowledge here about how to honor the water. And she's also learning oral history about this community that was buried uh, about 500 years ago. Now they're getting to the Kittelope River and Mick's driving because he has more experience with the river. Um, Gladys goes up to spot deadheads. So I'm going to read some of the descriptive details about the river and the lake um, on page 113. We started up the river, hugging the shore. The banks were covered in yellow, dry grass. I looked out for kermode bears, which are black bears that are cream-colored, white, or very pale brown. But I didn't see any, just a pair of eagles that circled high above us, then lost interest and flew towards the ocean. The water was furiously foaming and surging, so we virtually crawled up the river. Mom would shout out if she saw a log or deadhead in front of us and use her hand to point which direction Mick should go. We stopped just before we reached the lake, and Mom pointed out some indentations in the rock on the beach that she said were footsteps of the stone man. They were in granite. They looked like real footsteps. Can we go up? Mick shook his head. The stone man isn't in the mood for company today. He steered us into the lake. That's where we'll be staying tonight. Where's the stone man, I said. On the north side, I could see a pale strip of sand. Kittelope Lake was wide enough that the shores on the opposite side were a thin line. Ringed with mountains, the lake was choppy because the winds were funneled straight down from the glaciers towards the ocean. Mom pointed to the mountain behind the sandy beach. The clouds hadn't lifted high enough for us to see him. When I was little, she told me that the stone man was once a young hunter with a big attitude. He thought he knew everything, so when the elders warned him not to go up the mountain one day, he laughed at them and went up anyways. Near the top, he sat down to rest and wait for his dogs. A cloud came down and turned him to stone. Sometimes, when the wind blows right, she said, you can hear him whistling for his dogs. So this passage is significant for a few reasons. One is animism. So the mountain is, in fact, a man. It is imbued with human qualities. The word for that is anthropomorphism. It's kind of a step beyond personification. So instead of just describing the mountain with the qualities of a human, it is, in fact, a human. So the object uh, is anthropomorphized as a human, rather just being, uh, being described with human-like qualities. This also shows how significant the landscape is for Indigenous people. It's like where I went to Teachers College in Thunder Bay. There's a similar land formation. It's called the Sleeping Giant, and it's, a, it's supposed to be Nanabush. So it looks like a man sleeping um, on his back. So similar to that, it shows how important the landscape is and how oral tradition is tied to a specific place, not just the land in general, but a specific mountain or a specific river. We're not going to go through this entire flashback because it's kind of a long one and you guys can read it. There are a couple of instances of foreshadowing I wanted to point out. One is uh, back on page 108. Um, where Lisa mentions that she had, uh, I'll read the passage. Late that night, I dreamed I was at the docks watching Jimmy dive off the breakwater logs. I waited and waited for him to surface, but the water was still and dark. I woke, heart hammering. I heard groans. I pulled the blankets tighter. The moaning was soft at first, then got louder. So what does this foreshadow? Uh, well, the main plot of the novel, uh, Jimmy's disappearance, going missing in the water. The next example is on page 119 when Mick goes for a swim in the water and Lisa has a strange feeling. She says, I couldn't explain the feeling I had and didn't want it to ruin this newly restored good mood. Seals, 
They'll come when the Ulikins get here. On page 120, they stop just to try and see the stone man one more time. Um, and Lisa describes it as a large, black, hunched-over figure sat on the side of the mountain staring down at the lake. It felt like he was watching me, like one of those trick pictures that has eyes that follow you. Over on page 122, there's a bit of drama. So we learn that um, we see Mick come up and surprise Gladys with a, a gentle kiss on the neck. So we've seen Mick and Gladys flirt this whole time, uh, really throughout all of Lisa's memories, but particularly on this trip when Al's not there. So um, we see that something is going on here between Mick and Gladys. We move back into the present on page 124. As Lisa's thinking about her brother over on page one, 125, she's got another um, reminder of how powerful the ocean is. She says, less than one hundredth of a percent of the deep sea has been glimpsed. Astronauts have flown 348,000 kilometers to walk on the moon, but nobody's actually set foot on the deep, deepest ocean floor. So this shows just how little humans know about the ocean or the natural world in general and how much more powerful nature is than humans. And we also learn about Jimmy's superstition about the crows, how Mama U told him it was good luck and he fed the crows before he won his first swim meet. So now he thinks it's his good luck charm and he always feeds the crows. Then of course there's Jimmy's favorite crow, Spotty, who takes the, the watch and drops it in the air, um, lets the cars run over it to open it up. So apparently crows do this with clams as well. They'll um, drop them on a, they'll fly over a rock or something hard and, and drop them on that in order to break them open so they can eat the clams. So the next flashback Lisa has is of her first sex education class. We can see she's getting a bit older in her flashbacks here. So she's probably in about grade five. So after the sex ed class, Lisa goes over to Tab's house and Trudy's drinking. Uh, she's got some friends there. Josh is there. And Trudy is um, tormenting her daughter. Lisa stands up to Trudy over on page 128. You're being really mean, I said. Tab kicked my ankle under the table, but I kept going. She doesn't even like boys. Aunt Trudy's glazed eyes switched from Tab to me. She blinked and stared at me as if I'd just appeared. Miss High and Mighty, aren't we? Miss High and Mighty? Let's go, I said to Tab. You think you're so good? You think you're so special, don't you? Don't you have a special friend, girly girl? Mom, Tab said. Stop it. Shut up, you whore, Aunt Trudy said to Tab. I stood up. Shut up, you drunk. Tab gave an exasperated sigh. Lisa. I couldn't believe she was taking her side. She can't talk to you like that. You think I'm a drunk, Aunt Trudy said. I'm not half the drunk your precious Uncle Mick was. I stood in Aunt Trudy's kitchen and couldn't make my mouth work. Aunt Trudy grinned. All dried up now, is he? All sober and clean? Oh, he was a horny dog when he was drunk. He was not. Mom, we've got homework, Tab said. Come on, Lisa. Panting after your mother? You're a liar. Aunt Trudy laughed, which woke up Josh, who'd passed out on his chair. He blinked at us, then asked Aunt Trudy for a beer. So Trudy basically spills the beans about um, Mick and Gladys here. Um, and as we see when Lisa goes back the next day that Trudy had blackouts, so she doesn't even remember seeing these things and think that Lisa found out from Erica. So we're getting pretty close to the end of part one here. Uh, we're going to move over to page 131. Um, and there's a brief interlude here about the sea otter. Again, this is just a, a little example of foreshadowing and what's to come. Now at the bottom of page 131, the little man pops up. He was the one who came right before, the day before the chickens were hurt, the day before the tsunami, um, the day before the dogs, and the day before Mick came. Lisa says, the little man woke me near dawn, his eyes glittering and black. The Winnie the Pooh stories end with Christopher Robin saying he's too old to play with Pooh Bear. Little Jackie Piper leaves Puff the Magic Dragon. 
Childhood ends and you grow up and all of your imaginary friends disappear. I'd convinced myself that the little man was a dream brought on by eating dinner too late. Mom had told me she always dreamed of earthquakes if she ate too much lasagna. Sometimes he came dressed like a leprechaun, but that night he had on his strange cedar tunic with little amulets dangling around his neck and waist. His hair was standing up like a troll doll's, a wild electric red. He did a tap dance on my dresser, then he slipped, fell into my laundry basket, and pulled my sweaters and t-shirts over his head. The basket tipped over and rolled beneath my window. I watched it warily, my chest aching so hard I couldn't catch my breath. You little bastard, I whispered. He popped into the air behind me. I didn't know he was there until he touched my shoulder with a cold, wet hand. When I spun around to smack him, he stared at me with wide, sad eyes. Even after he disappeared... I could feel where his hand had touched me, and I knew he'd been trying to comfort me. So we see Lisa's relationship with the supernatural change. On the one hand, she sees the little man as more of a positive and not just a negative, but also she's becoming more skeptical. So as she gets older, it's a little bit harder for her to accept that um, these things are actually happening. So Lisa's still very troubled by this dream. Uh, the next day, she's upset, and Mick comes and sits beside her. Mick tells Lisa he's going to go away at some point, and Lisa's still troubled by her dream. My cereal had no taste. I couldn't eat. The dream still crowded around me. Jimmy watched TV in the living room, and the cheerful pops and endless bubbly music of his cartoon show faded for a moment. Sunlight broke through the clouds, brightening up the kitchen so much that I felt dizzy, like I was falling. I jerked upright, disoriented, staring into my Rice Krispies. Uncle Gordy phoned later that morning to say that the seals were getting at the nets, and that if we wanted any of our coho, we should go and check them. Mick's truck is here, Dad said as we drove into the bay. Maybe he's having coffee somewhere, I said. Dad frowned, parking the car at a distracted angle to Uncle Mick's truck. Flirting away with someone, I bet when he said he'd check the net. Dad honked the car horn impatiently, but Uncle Mick didn't appear. Damn it, the seals will get everything. I hadn't slept since the little man left me. I kept thinking, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. Mick's just goofing off, he's fine. The rest blurs like a shaky homemade movie. My feet heavy as we walk down the dock. The speedboat's outboard motor cranky and refusing to start for five endless minutes of Dad yanking on the cord. The choppy ocean, the net, all the corks along the middle sunk under the water. Mick's speedboat pushing itself against the shore, nudging it and scraping slowly along the rocks. Seals bobbing their dark heads between the white caps as Dad picked up his shotgun and fired and fired at them, then reloaded, saying, Don't look. Morning light slanted over the mountains. The sky was faded denim blue. Grumbling, a raven hopped between the branches of the tightly packed trees. Water sparkled as a seal bobbed its dark head in the shallows. A deer paused at the shoreline, alert. It flicked its tail up, showing white, then bounded up the beach and into the forest. In the distance, the sound of a speedboat. It's easy to miss here because this passage has a bit of a dreamlike quality. But why is Lisa's dad telling her not to look at what the seals are eating? So we see Mick's boat. It's abandoned. We see eels, seals eating something and Al shooting at them to try to get them to stop eating this thing. So I'll leave you guys to figure it out. Next, Spotty the Crow wakes up Lisa from another dream. And that moves us back into the present where we finish off part one. Everyone is still worried about Jimmy, and they get a phone call that there was a an empty life raft found. So they haven't found the Queen of the North, obviously, but they found an empty life raft with no people. So Lisa's parents decide to head down there. Lisa's parents head down south to somewhere around Vancouver where the boat was found, and Lisa doesn't go with them at first, but she wants to go and help to find her brother Jimmy. So what does she decide to do? She steals her parents' speedboat and pays for the gas with her dad's credit card and heads down by herself on the boat. So that finishes off part one. We didn't cover every single detail, but we covered most of what's in part one.
I make these videos to hopefully be helpful in understanding the novel. If you did find it helpful, please like the video or add a comment below.